Okay, guys, let's go ahead and start talking about Chapter 5, uh, the Periodic Table and Periodic Law. Now, um, in the early or 1790s, uh, there was a compiled list of elements of only 23 of the known elements. And in the 1800s, many of the elements were discovered. Uh, they used spectrometers, which identifies and isolates elements according to their spectra. And by 1870, there were 70 known elements um, in the world. Now, chemists were overwhelmed with learning the properties of all the new elements. Uh, but one thing that they did agree on, they agreed on the atomic masses of the elements that were discovered. And in 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev uh, started and he arranged all the known elements by atomic masses. And he found similar properties at certain intervals. Now, he published the first periodic table in 1869. Okay? And he left empty spaces on his periodic table because he predicted that undiscovered elements should be there. Okay, And later on, his predictions were confirmed and persuaded the other chemists. Now, the periodic law states that there is a periodic repetition of chemical and physical properties of elements when they are arranged in increasing atomic number. Now, Mendeley's periodic table was arranged by the atomic masses, and it wasn't later that we get this per periodic law that says that it's increasing by the atomic number. Now, why is it so important that we have the periodic table? Well, the periodic table helps us to understand the behavior and the reactions and the properties of elements. It gives us an idea of how it's going to react. It gives us a roadmap for the elements. Now, Mendeleev wasn't completely correct. He wasn't 100% right. Later, they discovered that even some elements that were in certain groups on the periodic tables would have different properties. Okay, And it wasn't until 1911 that Henry Mosley found that the pattern worked best if the elements were arranged by the number of protons, the atomic number. Okay, our current periodic table uses this method of arrangement. Our periodic table is arranged by the number of protons, the atomic number. Now, the arrangement of electrons in order of their atomic number, and the reason why we did that was so that elements with similar properties fall in the same column or the same group. So the elements here on the periodic table we look at the halogens, the halogens have very similar properties. Okay, They all have seven valence electrons and they all kind of behave in the same way. Okay, Now, what we did, if you look at the previous periodic table, you see at the very bottom you have two periods on the very bottom. Well, the reason why we put those are called the lanthanide and actinide series on the very bottom is just to save space. Okay, We put them in their original place where they should be and the periodic table is a lot more wide. Now, the electron configurations in the periodic table. Uh, we have periodicity, which is the way um, in which properties of elements are repeated depending on their location in the periodic table. The reason for periodicity is explained by the arrangement of electrons around the nucleus. So depending on the electron configuration, will depend on the properties of the element. Okay, The periodicity is telling us and showing us that, well, these elements are going to react a certain way because where they are on the periodic table, because of their electron configuration. Now, if we look at the periodicity of atomic numbers, we see that it occurs very periodically. The difference between the noble gases, if we look at helium and neon, the difference is 8. Well, the difference between neon and argon, again, is 8. And argon and krypton, well, that would be 18. Okay, And we see that between krypton and xenon, it's 18. And between xenon and radon, it's 32. 
So we see a periodic increase on the periodic table. Now, why are electrons so important? Well, the electron configuration of an atom's highest occupied energy level governs the atom, atom's chemical properties. Okay, so elements in a vertical group share similar chemical properties because they have similar outer electron configurations. And this is where we're talking about valence electrons. Okay, now the noble gases, the noble gases are what every atom is striving to be, what every atom wants to be. Okay, the noble gases contain an octet, which meaning it has eight electrons in its outer energy level, it has eight valence electrons. Now what this does is it makes them inert or very stable so that they don't react easily with other elements. Well, all elements and all atoms want to be stable. They want to have stability. They want to have those eight valence electrons. Okay, and valence electrons again are electrons available to be lost, gained, or shared in the formation of chemical compounds. So they're the electrons that are included in the electron's highest energy level, which you can think the highest energy level is the farthest out an atom can get, which would make sense because those atoms that are farther out are basically on the outside. Those are the ones that bump into other elements. So those are the electrons that are in chemical reactions. The valence electrons allow chemical reactions to happen. And we see that we can look at the group number uh, going from 1 and 2 and then 13 through 18 and we can see their electron configurations. And their electron configurations are set up so that in group 1 we have one valence electron, in group 2 we have two valence electrons, in 13 we have three, 14 we have four, 15 we have five, 16, six, 17, seven, and 18, eight. Now, they are in these groups, and if you look, you can see in the middle, we've kind of left out the transition metals. And the reason why we leave out the transition metals is because their valence electrons will vary. Now, when we're in group 1, 2, 13 through 18, those electrons, those valence electrons are stable. Okay, they have a set number of valence electrons, and they won't change. Now, the electron configurations and how they're set up on the periodic table lends us to periodic properties, okay, periodic trends. And the first one we're going to look at is atomic radius or atomic radii. Okay? It's defined by the edge of its orbital, orbital, but since the edges are fuzzy and difficult to determine, what they do is they put two atoms together that are identical. They measure between nucleus to nucleus and then they take half of that. Basically what atomic radii is, it's half the distance between the nucleus of an identical atom that are bonded together. The atomic radii is the size of the atom. How large is it from the nucleus to the electron cloud? Now with the atomic radii we can see a trend. As we move down a group on the periodic table like in our very first column over here, we see, oop, go back to it, sorry. We see that in group one here, as we move down that group, this number increases, meaning the size of the atom increases. So we see that as we move down on the period, or as we move down on the group, it increases the size of the atom. And if we look at our period, as we go from right, to left on the period, we see that it also increases. And there are some discrepancies, but in general, it follows this trend. So we see that it decreases across the periods and it increases down the column. The smallest would be helium and the largest would be francium. Now we see this as it increases from going from the very top over here to the very bottom over here. So it increases as we go down the groups and left across the periods. Increases down and to the left. 
Now, we look at some examples, which is bigger. We have sodium, rubidium, and we see that sodium and rubidium are in the same group. So therefore, we look at which, well, which one is higher, which one's lower, and we see rubidium is lower, so that would be our highest or biggest atomic radii. And then we have sodium and sulfur. Sodium is all the way to the left. Sulfur is all the way to the right. So we know that it increases as we move left. So sodium would be larger. And then lastly, we have sulfur and terulium. And we see that sulfur is up top, terulium is down at the bottom. So Te would be larger. Now the next trend we're going to look at is called ionization energy. Okay, and what this states is that the, it's the energy required to remove one electron from a neutral atom. Okay, now electrons can be removed from an atom if we use enough energy. Okay, and we call it ionization energy because as an atom loses or gains an electron, it has a positive or negative charge, and so therefore we call it an ion. An ion is an atom or a group of bonded atoms that have a positive or negative charge due to the loss or gain of an electron. So the energy that it requires to gain or lose that electron, and in this case we are taking that electron, we're losing that electron, that's going to be our ionization energy. Now, in those ions, and what we have to look at, when we're creating ions, we can either have a cation or an anion. Now, a cation is a positive ion caused by an atom losing an electron. And we see that for the most part, the only types of elements on the periodic table that lose an electron are metals. Okay, an anion is a negative ion caused by an atom gaining an electron. And then a metalloid, remember those guys are in the middle, they don't know what to be. Uh, they don't know if they're metals or nonmetals, so they can either be a cation or anion. They can either gain or lose. Now, if we look at ionization energy with those ions, we see that we have an atom, and where we have energy added to it, and what happens if we add enough energy to it, that atom will give up an electron, and the amount of energy it takes to do that will be the ionization energy. And we see that it has a trend as well. We see that as we move up on the groups, we have a higher ionization energy. And as we move from left to right across the periods, we see that ionization energy increases. So it increases across the periods and decreases down the columns, which it will look like this. So it increases as we move to the right, and it increases as we move up the period, or up the group, I'm sorry. Now, which one's larger? We have lithium and fluorine. Lithium is all the way to the left, fluorine's all the way to the right, so fluorine wins. We have calcium and phosphorus. Calcium's all the way to the left, phosphorus is all the way to the right, Phosphorus wins. And then we have barium and lithium. Lithium is on top, barium is on bottom, so lithium would win.